Round of applause, come on. Good morning, Jerry. Welcome back to uh, Long Beach Comic Con, or Long Beach Comic Expo, I'm sorry. It's hard to differentiate between the two, so it, it, well, they're so different. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Especially now, but like before it was like, Expo had that, you know, it was one day, and it was like, it, it, it had that old school convention feel, right. you know? It's like the digging through old smelly boxes, and now it's pretty much the same. Pretty, yeah. Which is great, because it's, it's nice to have it like twice a year. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, how you doing? I'm good, good. Yeah. It's uh, nice to be out here. Are you awake? It's <laughs> Sunday morning. There's worse ways to get yeah. Just been a Sunday, I'm sure. Absolutely. So. We have a nice police box, so we don't have to ever need to escape. Exactly. It's the quick escape TARDIS, you know. That's that's what I like to do. Yeah. So, uh, I, you and I actually haven't had a chance to sit down and talk, really, since, uh, since we did the photo shoot a long time ago, actually. Um, it, I like to just kind of run through things. That's cool. You know, just kind of have, have a talk. So how you been? <laughs> what? So how you been? You know, <laughs> we're hanging in there. Yeah, you know, just, just uh, fun. Where'd you grow up, Jerry? Uh, well, I'm a native New Yorker. Uh, I grew up in uh, Brooklyn and Queens. Uh, okay. First ten years in Brooklyn. And next eight years in Queens, and then. So I've been, I, I was a New Yorker for my early 20s. Wow. Uh, and completely lost all New York accents. Maybe not all my New York accents. Um, now, I started reading Marvel The Untold Story just recently. Uh, the Untold Story. And you're a big part of it. There, I, I had no idea that you were pretty much the youngest Marvel employee. Ever. Well, I, yeah, I guess I was. I mean, Stan, uh, when he started uh, at Marvel in the 40s, was, I think, 18. So I was probably maybe a, you know, a few months younger than he was when he started. I was 17 or so uh, when I did my first stories for Marvel. Uh, and then when I became a full time writer for them, I think I was 18. Wow. So I was pretty young. <laughs> that's, that's pretty young. I mean, yeah. Shear started when he was 14 at DC. Right. right. Well, I, I had actually started writing comics several years before that. I, I started writing for DC Comics. Uh, uh, I started pitching stories to DC when I was 15 and then sold my first story to them when I was 16. Oh, what was it? Uh, it was a three page horror story that I did for uh, uh, an editor named Murray Boltonoff, who was under the mistaken impression that I had already sold stories to Dick Giordano because he saw me hanging around Dick's desk for weeks and weeks and you know, he just assumed that I was one of the talented new young writers and he had no idea that I was not any of that. So <laughs> he uh, bought my first story and uh, then that encouraged Dick to actually buy from me, oddly enough, you know, because now somebody else had validated me as a writer. And, oh, funny. And I just kept going from there. So how did you start so young? getting into the offices of DC Comics. Well, it, it, it was very different back in the, as we're talking about the mid-60s, yeah. uh, than it is today. I mean, today you have to go get security passes and, uh, you know, have somebody on the inside let you in and all of this. Uh, back in the, in the mid-1960s, uh, the DC offices were, do you watch the show Mad Men? Uh, yeah. They were, they were like the show, uh, like the offices of, of Cooper uh, uh, Draper, you know, they yeah. were very, uh, very businesslike, but at the same time, uh, kind of small, not very uh, big. And every Thursday during the summer, they had a tour where they would uh, let whoever showed up, they would bring them back uh, behind the scenes, and you could go back and they would show you around the, the company. Uh, and I started going on the tour, and then after a couple of weeks, I started slipping away from the tour group <laughs> and knocking on the doors of the various editors and asking if I could draw for them or write for them, you know, and they were kind enough not to throw me out. And eventually, I made enough of an acquaintance with a number of the editors there that they started to take me seriously and, uh, you know, accept story ideas and proposals. And nothing was really taking off. I spent about a year going in after school. I would like get the first bus away from my uh, uh, 
for my school and take it down to the subway and take the subway into Manhattan. Wow. Go to the DC office and tell them that I was there to see so and so. <laughs> so and so would be, oh yeah, sure, you know, you can come on in. <clears throat> and I spent about a year doing this every couple of days during the week. Um, and a guy named George Cashin, who was the editor of Hawkman at the time, he had taken over from Julie, uh, eventually kind of, kind of was leaning in the direction of buying one of my premise of stories for a Hawkman uh, story. And then he got fired and replaced by Dick Giordano. And I remember I called up George to see what he had thought of this particular plot uh, that I had submitted. And he said, well, you know, there's some changes here. You know, I'm not going to be editing anymore. I'm going to be writing. Uh, the guy you should be talking to now is Dick Giordano. And so I called up Dick Giordano and said, hi, I've been working with George Cashton. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if I could come in. And then that led me to the... So lying is basically... Well, exactly. I was working with George. <laughs> Or George. <laughs> right. I, I guess my message you know, to, to uh, would be writers is to uh, be completely thick skinned and oh, yeah, you have to. just bang your head against that wall endlessly yeah. until you break the wall or you're breaking your head. Exactly. So, where did this, this passion for comic books come from? What was the first book that you read? God, I think the first. Well, I don't remember what the first comic was. I know I read Superman when I was a little kid. Uh, I know I read The Flash, because that was uh, stuff that was available at uh, uh, one of the uh, camps, on the camps I was at. But the first comic book I consciously remember wanting to buy and getting my mom to buy for me was Fantastic Four number four. Oh, wow. Uh, which was, uh, I believe the one with Submariner uh, on the cover. Uh, carrying Sue Storm, you know, and yeah, Storm, this yeah. classic issue. And I was like, what is this? You know, and I read it and I was like bowled over by it. Went back to the news and they had number three. So I was like, I want that one. And I was like, wow. Uh, and you're like, what, 12 at the time, right? Uh, I would say it would have been 1962 or three, so I would have been 10 or 11. So in, within four or five years then, yeah. You're well, I was just relentless. I mean, I, I, I was passionate about the comics. Uh, I was drawing and creating my own Fantastic Four wow. stick figure comics, uh, collecting them, uh, reading every comic I could get my hands on. We moved, at that point, we, we had a year or so after that, like, we had moved from Brooklyn to Queens. So I was kind of a lonely kid. And I was trying to, you know, I was spending a lot of my time uh, indoors reading. And, uh, I think I read a, in a letters page about this kid, oh, Jim Shooter, who was writing uh, Legion of Superhero stories. Uh, and yeah, I, I liked his, his stories. I was like, well, I, I want to do that. <laughs> You're like, if you can do that, I'm yeah. the same age. <laughs> Talked my dad into taking me into the DC offices for wow. a tour. And one thing led to another. That's it's awesome. Persistence and stupidity. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's also the age where you don't understand right. the fact that, like, Oh, it's, why not? Why can't yeah, I do absolutely. this? Absolutely. You know, the, your confidence is, if you're a teenager, you know, you swing between confidence and insecurity, uh, and you have complete lack of, of grasp of what the realities of any given situation are. So, that works to your advantage, you know, in a creative okay. field. You know, yeah. Not knowing that you can't do something is a superpower. Uh, <laughs> did, did you ever have to, did you ever have any run-ins with more? Did I what? Do you have any run-ins with Mort? Mort Weisinger? Mort Weisinger? Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, he was I kind of a bull, right? He was a, well... Because every story I hear about him was just... You know, I never actually... I, I, I worked with him very briefly. I, I submitted some Superman oh, so scripts to him, uh, spec scripts. And uh, he was nice enough to read them, you know, and, and uh, was extremely critical of them, said that they were, any, were not any good. Uh, then if... Then if a year or two later, when I was finally working for DC on a fairly regular basis and looking for any opportunity to do anything, uh, Nelson Bridwell was writing a, uh, uh, the equivalent of the, 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 the DC bullpen yeah. page. And he was doing this for all the different books. And I asked him if I could write one, you know, for this. You know, I was, again, I was looking for anything I could do yeah. to make uh, some money or to, to, to get my foot in somewhere. 
So he said, sure, you know, so I wrote a, uh, I don't know, one page, uh, this is happening in DC type of thing. And what I didn't know, and yet maybe Nelson didn't know, was that Mort was reading all of these um, to keep an eye on Nelson, because Nelson was his assistant editor, and he didn't want Nelson getting too, too <laughs> ahead of himself. Uh, and Mort, like, jumped all over it, you know, all the things that were wrong with it, you know, all the things that, that I was doing wrong, you know, and it's like, it's a fan page, it's like nothing, you know, it's a letters column, it's yeah, a letters column, you know, and um, that was my only real encounter with Mort, really? you know, to, in any hands-on way. Uh, so he did, he did say one creepy thing to me once, you know, and I, I can't remember the exact words of it, but, but it was something that, that had a vaguely sexual connotation. Really? That he that said, you know, it would, you know, it would be like a honeymoon couple feeling each other out. Yeah. <laughs> wow. I was like, what? <laughs> Thank you, more. I mean, he's Not the guy that had to throw a shooter to, uh, you know, uh, basically a nervous breakdown at 20, you know? No, I feel that, you know, whatever one may think of shooter's behavior over the years, you know, with, with and up and down, oh, yeah. and a rather and, and a rather controversial figure. I my my, my heart goes out of the guy uh, because of the way that Moore treated him. Oh yeah, at, at the age that he was, if it didn't treat me that if I had had a, didn't have the kind of emotional support that I had with people like Nick Giordano, yeah. who was much kinder, gentler soul. Uh, you know, it would have been a traumatic experience for me too. Sure. So how did you meet Stan? Because that was that was your your road into Marvel. You met Stan. Well, I didn't meet Stan. I met Roy. Oh, Roy okay, Thomas. that's right, that's right, sorry, yeah, yeah, so you were, uh, I met Roy Thomas uh, socially, uh, you know, there, was, there were uh, these gatherings of writers and artists at, uh, in the comic uh, world called uh, First Fridays, and the First Fridays were uh, the first Friday of the month, you know, at various different writers and artists' uh, apartments around Manhattan, we would get together, and it would just basically be, you know, potluck, bring your, bring your own, so I would go to these, uh, and I was the youngest person there. I was like 17 years old, whatever, 16, 17 years old, and, and hanging out with these incredibly mature guys in their 20s. And, uh, you know, we would meet each other. And at, at that point, DC, the Marvel was trying to start competing with DC in slightly other, in different areas of the superhero books. And DC was having a lot of success with these old mystery, horror story uh, magazines like House of Secrets. Yeah, some history that I was writing. And Roy was looking to do uh, uh, Marvel's own version of that, I think Tower of Shadows or something, Chamber of Secrets or something like that. And he was approaching the different people who were doing similar things for DC. So I got to do a story for Marvel, uh, for House of Tower of Secrets, Shadows, or whatever it was. And then that led to me submitting other stories and getting to know the people at Marvel eventually being offered a uh, regular assignment on uh, uh, Daredevil and Iron Man. Wow. So, yeah. And you started, well, how many books were you writing uh, on a regular <laughs> month? Oh, uh, at various points. I mean, I think at my peak I was writing between five and six regular monthly titles. And at, uh, at DC. Were you, were you writing and editing at the same time when you were at Marvel? Well, the way Marvel worked uh, in the early 70s was they had one editor, uh, Stan was the editor, yeah. the editor, and then Roy was his assistant editor. And that worked great when they were publishing 10 titles a month. Yeah. Uh, and Stan was kind of a hands-off editor. Uh, you didn't get plots approved so much as you'd get like a general direction of what you wanted to do. Uh, so the first time that an editor would actually look at the material was when it, after it had been written it penciled and drawn and plotted. But and at that point, there's not much you can do. Yeah. So the, you know, you can look back at the early Marvel books in the early early 1970s uh, Marvel books, and you can see where some balloons have been completely relettered and oh, really? new stuff is added, and that's that's when they were doing the editorial work that today we would do at, at yeah. a much earlier stage. Um, so that was kind. Of, you had a kind of certain level of freedom, uh, and you. Were, encouraged to uh, work closely in collaboration with your artists and in effect become like a, an assistant editor. Yeah. But as the company expanded, as the number of titles became, uh, you know, they started publishing more titles, this structure didn't work. 
you know, so you ended up with what amounted to uh, writers being de facto editors of the books that they were working on because nobody, you know, nobody can read 50 titles a month and provide the kind of oversight and input that you, that you need as an editor. So you ended up with writers acting as editors. Um, so when did you first meet Stan then? Well, I met Stan in, in around 1970. Yeah. Uh, he uh, they had a thing called the Marvel Writing Test, uh, which was an informal kind of test where they, they gave you Xeroxes of uh, several pages of uh, a, a comic book story that Stan had already written, and you were asked to do the dialogue for it, the yeah. dialogue. And I did, uh, when Roy decided he wanted to bring me on as a regular writer, rather than just doing these one or two stories here and there, they had me do a Captain America, five pages of a Captain America, uh, Gene Cole and Captain America. Oh, wow. And I wrote it, gave it to, to Roy, he read it, he liked it, he gave it to Stan. Stan was like, eh, it's okay. You know, and Roy said, well, you know, I think he writes really well for a 17-year-old. Stan said, well, can we get somebody who writes well for a 21-year-old? <laughs> That was my first encounter with Stan. I did a couple of stories. He, he needed some plots for a Fantastic Four. I wrote a couple of plots that uh, were, went uncredited for, for Fantastic Four. Uh, and then eventually, uh, you know, I was given a regular assignments on Daredevil and Iron Man and so on. And when Stan left uh, Thor, I think it was, that was the first big Marvel book. You know, that I, but you, you and Stan got pretty close for a while there. No, no. I mean, Stan never got close. In the, book, in the book, they make it sound like you guys were, well, was, we, you were kind we, of like I his did, secret work with him, man. Yeah, I did work with him fairly regularly. Uh, but Stan is not somebody that you get close to. Really? No, he's not a, he's not a, uh, I mean, he's a nice guy, but, you know, he's a, he, he, he sees, at least back then, you know, there was, yeah. a, there was a, a hierarchy that was Stan. And there was everyone else. Yeah. <laughs> it's like you know, you're either, you know. So if it's you're not saying that way, right? He doesn't really have anything to say to you. Yeah. You know, if you're not <laughs> but that's not to say we didn't encounter each other a lot. Yeah. yeah. But then there was the the thing in the book they make it the big deal of you getting passed over for yeah. the EIC job. Yeah. For, for well, I, I felt at the time, and I, I don't necessarily feel this way today, but uh, I was supposed. To, I felt that I was supposed to be next in line as editor-in-chief after Roy. Uh, Roy, as I say, you had Stan, then you had Roy. And I was the third writer, you know, that was brought in, uh, you know, in this triumvirate yeah. of writers. And then when Stan left, basically I was promoted up to the second position, you know, as, as, and because Roy didn't want to write the books that Stan had, was best known for, you know, like uh, Thor and uh, uh, Spider-Man and so on. I ended up taking over those books, so I became de facto the, the head writer at Marvel in that area. I mean, it wasn't, you know, we didn't think of it in those terms, but that's kind of how it looked. Uh, and when Roy would go on vacation, I was the one who was called in to look at the books to make sure everything was cool. You know. It was not a big deal, yeah. but in my teenage, you know, <laughs> early 20-something mind, there was a clear connection there. And at one point, Stan said to me, you know, if any time, when Roy, if Roy leaves, you know, I want you to know that you know, I, want to, I want to put you in that position. Uh, as it turned out, when Roy did leave, uh, there were other editors, assistant editors, who were in the office at the time, like uh, Ian Moore Wolfman, uh, and I was on the other coast at a, on a vacation. And, uh, Stan, who doesn't deal well with crisis, you know, just wants a solution yeah. and wants to move on. Uh, there was a crisis. Roy wasn't there. Uh, he needed people to edit the books. He had two assistant editors. He just promoted them and completely forgot that, that you were even around. Yeah. And because I wasn't in the office, I was not a staff person. I would. And, and to be fair, why would you put somebody who's not a staff person yeah. into a staff position? Uh, you know, he didn't. He didn't think that it was relevant, and he actually had probably, on, on some level, thought that he was doing me a favor uh, because he which did. when you got the job <laughs> finally. Yes, but I got the job a year later yeah. after after things really became chaotic. Yeah. Uh, 
you know, as I say, this was a, not a system that could work. You know, yeah. you had 50 titles a month, and you had one person in charge of all of those books. That's not a practical uh, no. setup. Um, and there were, f uh, by the time I came in, subsequently after my uh, turn at, at, at DC, um, you were right. so because after after Roy took after over, you went over, yeah. over to DC after like the next day, right? Passed over. <laughs> uh, I lasted about three or four months, you know, of, of seething, uh, bile uh, rising <laughs> uh, resentment, and decided, you know, I wanted to go somewhere where take my marbles and go somewhere <laughs> where I could <laughs> thought be better appreciated. And I was appreciated at DC. DC gave me a lot of opportunities uh, to learn how to edit. How to do that part of the business, uh, yeah. and then I came back, and uh, the system at that point had collapsed. Yeah. Uh, at uh, we had uh, every at the, the informal structure of writers being their own editors had now become a uh, factual structure, so that even though I was theoretically the editor of the entire line, I had no direct authority over that. Uh, half of the books, wow. and the other half were being written by people who either couldn't do the job or were, uh, you know, so insane <laughs> you know, that, that they, they were you know, people you couldn't really influence or, or talk to. And I lasted about a month and a half, which was so miserable, and I'm happy with the circumstances that, uh, again, uh, I just sit down. I can't it sounds like it was just just chaos at that, that point. It's horrible. I mean, oh, what was the what the Marvel offices like? Because they, they make it sound like it was just like this hippie like commune almost well, at some point. It was it was it was very. I think it was the product of, 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 of a couple of things, which were uh, the company growing so dramatically in such a short period of time. We went from being a company that was doing 12 titles a month, being a company that was doing 60 titles a month, Jesus. Uh, in a span of maybe two, three years, and with no editorial oversight. Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. Uh, we also, this is the early 70s, uh, it was during a period of like tremendous counterculture, you know, uh, uh, lots of, lots of, uh, uh, lots of drugs involved, yes. lots of alcohol, a lot of teenage, teenage and young 20-something craziness. Um, and as a result, you know, you, 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 that's a caller, you know, of yeah, crazy. We didn't take it slowly. And you put that all in one big fishbowl. Right. <laughs> and, you know, enormous talents, you know, people with, with tremendous egos, uh, uh, some of it well-deserved, some of it not so well-deserved. Uh, there is one anecdote that I, that I tell to show just how crazy this got. Um, one of the books that I felt needed a new direction was a book called Son of Satan, uh, which was a marginal title under the best of circumstances. And it was being written by a guy who, if we had an editorial system that, that could have supported him, might have developed into a good writer, but he was not experienced enough to be doing this book. And I was looking to bring in another writer onto the book who uh, I knew from other experiences, and I knew that I could use him to develop, you know, other titles. So it was it was a way to sort of bring him in and bring this per move this person out. And I wasn't firing this guy from the company. He was he was working in the production department. He was working in the depression production department. So he was still going to have work. He was not going to be out of work. So I, I said, you know, I'm going to take you off this book. And, you know, we're going to give it to someone else. Well, about later that day, the assistant head of the production department came to me and uh, she was very very irate and said, you know, you can't fire him off of this book and we won't allow it. I said, what do you mean you won't allow it? Why, why can't I fire him off this book? She says, well, you don't understand. He's a member of our coven. I said, your coven? Yes, they had a coven. The <laughs> production department had a witch's coven that they were all part of, which makes sense why a guy was writing a son of Sam, a son of Satan. So, <laughs> and I was like, you know, I think I will be firing him off that book. Yes, you know, you can cast a spell on me if you want. But that was the that was the level of crazy that was 
was going on. Wow. Yeah. What's your favorite Stan Lee story? Um, probably my favorite Stan Lee story uh, was prior to this, uh, Marvel had offices in a building uh, that we shared with a number of other publications. And the, directly below Marvel's office was the office of the National Lampoon. Uh, the people in the National Lampoon later went on and became uh, the people who did Animal House. Uh, some of them went on and wrote for Saturday Night Live and so on. Uh, using the same pattern of behavior that I, I'd used to get into comics, I started going down and hanging out at the National Lampoon offices. I actually wrote, a, wrote something for National Lampoon at one point. But I got to know those guys. And we became friendly. And at one point, somebody sent a, uh, a fake bomb to the National Lampoon offices. Uh, you know, the sticks of dynamite, what uh, looked like sticks of dynamite with an alarm clock and a box and you know. So they call the police, uh, and uh, the police proceeded to have the building evacuated. So the offices, Marvel's offices, are, you know, there are people who are doing their work, and uh, at one point Stan comes walking out to know this people in a hurry way. like, hmm, Stan's leaving the room of the day, wonder what's going on there. And then about 20, 30 minutes later, there's a knock on the door, and a cop comes to the door, and he's like, why you people have not evacuated? You know, there's a bomb threat. We're talking, what do you mean? Why would we evacuate? Well, we called your boss, and we told him that there was a bomb. <laughs> and Stan just gets up and then left. <laughs> I, you know, I figured I gotta get out of here, you know. It's like, <laughs> don't tell anybody say, else. They well, get out. You know, as I say, there's Stan, and then there's everybody else. You know, so it just, it just maybe just missed. You know, okay. You, you hear these stories about Stanley, and these crazy, like, like egotistical kind of things. And I, I, I feel like sometimes he was just the guy that was pushed to yeah. run a company. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's the same. To have that experience, but he was. Just Stan is a sweet man. I mean, yeah. and, and, and whatever was going through his mind, I mean, the, at that particular stage, things were crazy for him. Uh, but he did, he did not, I mean, he has friends, obviously, from that era. I was too young to be a friend of his. I mean, yeah. I, was, I was 20 years, uh, 22 years old, and he was in his late 40s at that point. There'd be no, you know, emotional. No, of course. Person. But people who knew him uh, as a contemporary, you know, he was, Somebody who was very much uh, a supporter of a lot of the artists, uh, you know, at Marvel. But he made enemies too, yeah. because you know he was the public face of the company, and the people who who were less adept at uh, self promotion resented, you know, Stan putting himself forward. Um, but at the same time that he was putting himself forward, he was putting everybody else forward. Too. Exactly. I mean, he's the first person who gave credit to artists, you know, on a regular basis. Uh, in in the, in the Marvel books, I mean, and that led to DC doing it and other companies doing it. Um, but he was like many creative people, uh, s kind of self-centered and egotistical. But so are we all. Exactly, that's part of creative being. Yeah, yeah, something creative. I just feel like he gets the blunt treatment of, of, of a lot of stuff that happened back then when he was just, he's the guy that's running a company yeah. that doesn't know how to run a company. So, right. you know, it's like, well, you, 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 he, you he knew how to run, yeah, I mean, he had a particular way to run, run a company, but I mean, he didn't have the resources to do it properly. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, as I say, we expanded from 12 to 60 titles and we didn't create, we didn't expand the staff. Yeah. And that's because Martin Goodman, who was the, the publisher, yeah. um, and then subsequently sold it to another company called Cadence, they did not want to spend the money for additional staff. You know, they were always looking at ways to cut, cut corners and cut, uh, cut costs. Uh, so, you know, yeah, they wanted to put out more books, they didn't want to pay for it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, that's going to have consequences. Yeah. Did you ever have uh, much interaction with Jack Kirby? Uh, I actually worked with Jack twice. Uh, I worked with him at DC Comics uh, when uh, I was coming in as an editor. I was given commandy to, to work on with uh, Jack, so I worked on it briefly with him there. And then I actually worked with him a few years later at Ruby Spears, the animation studio, where he was uh, doing work for them uh, uh, on developing 
new uh, cartoon properties based around toys. And he and I were working on that at the same time, so I would see him occasionally there. Wow. What was he like? Jack was a guy, I mean, Jack was, Stan is very engaging. Stan is somebody who will, uh, like, when he is connecting with you, you will feel like you're the center of his attention. He's very, very, very uh, engaging. Jack was kind of the opposite in that he was an, an extroverted introvert. Um, this is my impression of him. You know, he, he um, was friendly enough, but, I, but my, my Jack story would be, I arrived at Ruby Spears one day uh, and was coming up to the elevator at the same time Jack was coming up to the elevator. I said, hi Jack, how you doing? He says, I'm great. Uh, you know, Patton was the uh, guy in the Ninth Army who everybody hated and uh, he didn't like the uh, way people treated him and he was like, never, and, and he went into his 15 minutes about Patton and the Ninth Army and then walked away. And I was like, what the hell was that? You know, it was like, I, I basically came in on the middle of an internal conversation that he was having. He engaged with me and continued the conversation and then went off. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah, and that's, that was Jack. I mean, yeah. Jack was, you know, somebody who was really into his own thing. And he would connect with you, but he wasn't connecting with you necessarily in as a lot of person. Yeah. You know, it's like it's, you were an echo chamber for him. Jack. Uh, and I think he resented Stan because Stan was much better at engaging with people and Jack didn't feel comfortable with that. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's, but that's based on, you know, a couple of interactions with Jack, of so I wouldn't know that that's, yeah. you know, an accurate uh, reflection. What was working with him like when you were doing commanding? Uh, very professional. I mean, he was, uh, I think by, that, by that point, Jack was kind of disengaged from really? DC. He was looking to move back to, to Marvel. He was angry with Carmine for the way Carmine uh, Carmen Infantino, the publisher, had uh, uh, handled Jack's New God series. Um, and I think he was ready to go. So, you know, he was just doing a job at that point. Yeah. Uh, so, one of your biggest, you know, people know you for is the fact that you killed Gwen Stacy. That's right. <laughs> what was it like taking over Spider-Man right out, you know, after, after Stan? Yeah in that epic 100-issue run, right? you know? Well, it was, it was intimidating. On, on one level, it was like, oh my god, you know, I'm, I'm going to be the, the second writer on Spider-Man. Uh, I have a big set of shoes to fill here, and that's very intimidating. Fortunately, my ego was such that I didn't, I didn't recognize my inadequacy, you know, to, to fill that. Um, and I, but it was a dream come true. I really, really wanted to write that character. That was a character that I had fallen in love with from the first issue. Uh, and what I would say, you know, I mean, people have asked, I and mean, we've talked about Gwen Stacy in the past in a number of interviews, uh, and people say, how could you kill this, this lovable character? And my attitude was to remind people that Gwen had basically, at that point, Spider-Man had been a ongoing title for about nine years, and Gwen Stacy had been Peter Parker's girlfriend for about three and a half of those years. Yeah. So she was hardly Lois Lane. You know, she was the most recent girlfriend. And she was not even, in my view, uh, the one that Peter had, that we had been set up to believe Peter would be with. That was Mary Jane. You know, there was a, there was about a, six months to a year, I mean, my memory is, is kind of uh, way off on these things, but there was a, a real long lead up to the introduction of Mary Jane Watson that went on for, you know, six months to a year. And when she finally arrived on the scene, you know, with the face of Tiger, you, you hit the jackpot moment, you know, at the end of one of these issues, it was, it was such a tremendous moment because it looked like Peter's life is finally going to cast some you know, positive forward momentum, you know. Or Peter's going to finally get a break. He's going to get some, you know, and it's going to be this one. <laughs> and then, for whatever reason, Stan sort of moved away from that storyline and introduced this character, Gwen Stacy. And Gwen, this is where, you know, this is where people's personalities influence their creative choices. Uh, Stan's married to a beautiful woman named Joan, 
who is a tall, statuesque blonde. His younger daughter is also named Joan, and she's also a statuesque blonde. And Stan, that's his type, you know, yeah. uh, that's what he likes. Uh, and even though, you know, Mary Jane had been the one that was sort of set into motion and structurally that's where you were going, uh, Stan introduced this other character uh, and f just had to make her, you know, Peter's girlfriend. Even though it didn't really, if, if you, I defy anyone, and I've said, I've said this over and over, you know, it's like, please, really look at those books with Gwen and Mary Jane, and tell me that Gwen is the more interesting character. No, she's really not, no. you know. Um, and she's, she's not, there's nothing that she brings to the dynamic, you know. She's just a nice girl, and, and God bless, she's a nice girl. If, if I hadn't been a ruthless uh, jerk, you know, and, and if we hadn't decided prior to this that we wanted to kill off a main character, Probably what I would have ended up doing is having written her out. You know, I mean, I would have basically yeah. had Mary Jane take more of a focal point, and Gwen might have, you know, slipped off to the side and maybe gone with Harry as she kind of did at one point. And you know, just would have she just would have evaporated because there's like she was milk. <laughs> she just would have evaporated. Uh, but what what it, what did happen was that we ended up with a situation where John Romita had who was the lead creative on the book at that point, you know, I was the writer, he was the, the, the leader. He wanted to uh, shake things up, wanted to do something dramatic. He used uh, the, the Milton Kniff uh, analogy, which was, he was a big Milton Kniff fan. Milton Kniff was yeah. a prior artist who did newspaper strips. And what Kniff would do is, that every couple of years, he'd kill off a main character uh, to, keep, to remind the readers that things dramatic could happen. So John wanted to kill off Aunt May. <laughs> I thought oh, yeah, yeah. everybody wants to kill her Aunt, off. Aunt May serves a purpose. You know, she's she's a reminder, constant reminder to Peter of his failure to save Uncle Ben. She was also uh, a great tool, you know, for for a plot. Oh yeah. Uh, she's a, a, a good MacGuffin, you know, for the story. Uh, so we were batting around other potential people, Joel Jameson. You know, why not him? You know? I said, you know, how about we get rid of Stacy, that'd be a real dramatic, you know, exciting thing. It'd be a big game changer, and it'll give me the opportunity to, you know, focus my attention on Mary Jane Watson. <laughs> Nobody disagreed. Nobody <laughs> said, "Yeah, sure, fine." You know, even Stan, who, uh, as I say, was kind of disengaged by this point, was, "Yeah, that's fine. You know, kill her off. That's that's okay." Because once Stan left a book, he stopped thinking about it. Yeah. Even though his statement was, "I had no idea." <laughs> Well, it, that's both true and false. <laughs> I mean, it's false in that he did know because we had to run it by him since it was a major change. And it's true because in the same way he forgot to let people know that there was a bomb in the building. <laughs> he didn't remember that we were there. Uh, I don't think he honestly processed the information and didn't really think about whether it made a big difference or not. Yeah. But, because again, he knew that she was a recent character that had been around for a few years and wasn't part of the integral Spider-Man story. But killing her, killing her the way we killed her, killing and the effect that it had on Peter's life and the effect that it had on the readers makes her a fascinating character uh, in the history of comics. And now, in retrospect, she has this tremendous gravitas yeah. uh, because we know how she ends. You know? It's like Ophelia in Hamlet. Uh, Ophelia, as a character, doesn't really s jump off the page, but as a character who commits suicide and is found floating among lilies, oh my God, Ophelia, we are so it's such a tragic, tragic, tragic figure. figure. Yeah. Yes. What was your besides Gwen? What was your favorite moment? Of, of well, I won't say that killing Gwen was my favorite moment. I would say you know, besides that, taking that out of the equation, I would, I would say did. actually, oddly enough, the, the clones. Saga that was forced on us when Stan did say, I want to, to see these characters back, gave me an opportunity to do some interesting things. I mean, it, it, it's what brought uh, Punisher into the book. It created, it enabled me to create uh, the Jackal or encouraged me to create the Jackal and to, to do this whole storyline that questions identity, questions who we are, and, and 
what makes us the person that we are. Uh, so that that was fun, you know. That was that was a necessity, you know, prompting a, a creative burst. So then, fast forward a little bit. He went to DC again mm -hmm. for a while. Yeah, for ten years. Yeah. And he went on to create a lot of characters there. Right. Yeah, I had, I had a, a, a really good long run at DC with. Uh, Created characters like Firestorm that we're seeing in the Flash right now, Vibe, which we're seeing, who is seeing in the Flash. Um, other characters that are appearing in a lot of CW shows and scenes. <laughs> so yeah, I had a, I, I went back to DC. Um, what brought you there? Well, when I left, I, when I first came, went back to when I first went to DC after uh, being passed over for, in my mind for the, the editorship of Marvel. Um, I really enjoyed being in charge of things, you know, being an editor and being creative. And, creative. and the, the thing about DC at that point was that they were desperately open to anything you wanted to do uh, because they really didn't know how to, how to compete with Marvel. Uh, when I went back the second time, it was because I was running away from, you know, Marvel's craziness, you know, this, this, the, After the, the insanity. Yeah, yes. I didn't feel a connection there. And, and that was not a, a particularly creative period at Marvel. I mean, it was creative in certain ways, but it was, it was chaotic. But at DC, I could basically come in and have the opportunity to do stories that nobody else was doing, you know, and take characters that weren't being done in an in a interesting way and hopefully do them in an interesting way. Because Nobody was writing like a Marvel book there. I mean, yeah. So I, this was when Marvin and Len were both still at Marvel. So I was basically the only person at DC that knew how to do that kind of stuff. It gave me a good. It gave me some, some leeway. So Firestorm. What did that come about? Well, Firestorm was. Uh, Firestorm, Firestorm was a result of two things. There was a, a business issue, which was DC wanted expand and compete with Marvel in, uh, in certain areas. They were, correct me if I'm wrong, but they were looking for their Wolverine at that point, right? They were, they were looking for their Wolverine, their like, well, I something that a, a new brand. I, I, I don't know if they were that conscious of it, because Wolverine wasn't really a big big thing. Yeah, but, but like the, they were looking for like their Spider-Man kind of they, thing. Yeah, so they, they, wanted, they, wanted, they wanted to shake things up and, and, yeah. and get to the next, next level. There was a new publisher, Jeanette Kahn, who was, uh, Looking to, to, to compete directly with with Marvel, um, and they were, they they had a fresh they were open to a fresh new start, uh, which they had not been under Carmine Infantino. Even though Carmine was trying to do new things, when we got new gods out of out of Carmine's era, but he was still very attached to the old way of doing things. Uh, Jeanette, not having any experience in comics at all, was wide open. So that provided an opportunity. Then the, the, for me, as a writer, I wanted to write Spider-Man. I wanted to write a young teen superhero again, um, so I could do the kind of uh, semi, semi lighthearted uh, fun stories that you really can't do with Superman or Batman or yeah. Wonder Woman. Uh, so I wanted that kind of character. Uh, and then I, as I was processing the, the different things that I enjoy uh, with characters, you know, I came up with uh, the notion for this, uh, basically the idea of what would be the opposite of a Peter Parker. Uh, Peter Parker is the nerd, the outcast, who gets superpowers and, you know, as a result, you know, becomes something bigger than, than he was. Yeah. And I thought to myself, what, well, what if it had been Flash Thompson who got bit by the spider, rather than Peter? In other words, the, the school jock, the guy who already had who already gets the girls because he's, you know, the cool dude, you know, at school, you know, the guy who's not the brightest bulb, uh, you know, in the, in the mix, you know, kind of an average intelligence, average kind of guy. Um, I thought, well, that'd be interesting, you know, that'd be, that'd be a diff different thing. And then coming up with, putting him with a smart guy, you know, to, to help provide the answers, uh, it created this kind of, unintentionally, this kind of archetypical Character, which is the adolescent, the adult voice in his head, uh, you know, which is the adolescent 
fighting against, you know, the overview of mature adults who, s who seem to know better than they know. And it's kind of an archetype that nobody's been doing, nobody still hasn't done since then. Uh, and it was obviously hit, hit a chord with some readers, but it had some... I loved the book as a kid. Yeah, yeah it was one of my favorites. Definitely. And it, was, it seemed like that was that time when DC was, they were really going on that, that edge. Yeah. Trying to have fun, you know, trying, to, trying to break the rules, break ground and, and uh, you know, change the rules. So you were at DC for 10 years, and then at what point did you make that transition into TV, writing for TV? Well, I was actually writing feature films with Roy Thomas Roy, and I both moved to California in the late 70s. Uh, Roy had some connections uh, because of the Conan uh, film. friends who were in the film business. And the two of us together, I mean, Roy didn't feel secure about writing screenplays on his own. I didn't have, you know, the access that Roy had. Both of us wanted to work in that field, so we ended up combining our skill sets and our connections and so on to, to do that. We collaborated on about uh, eight scripts uh, that we so we had a pretty good batting average. We had two films made out of eight, so that's pretty good. That is, yeah. uh, for for Hollywood system. Which films? Uh, Fire and Ice for Ralph Bakshi and Conan the Destroyer, the sequel. Uh, neither of which, you know, turned out as we wanted them to, but both of which have their fans. And, you know, that's how TV, that's how film works. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so we worked together from about six uh, seventy eight until about 84, and then I went through some major emotional midlife crisis crap. Our partnership broke up. Uh, I left DC, I went back to Marvel, uh, doing some writing for Marvel. I was working in animation, writing some animation, and I connected up with one of the people that Roy and I had worked with uh, on a Film project who now is writing, who is now writing and producing a show called Father Downey Mysteries uh, for uh, ABC, and I asked him for advice, and he brought me in, gave me a writing test, much like Roy had <laughs> 30 years before, 20 years before, uh, and then gave me a job. And wow! One thing led to another, and I worked my ass off for 20 years writing television. So you had Father, Father Dowling Mystery, what else? What other things? Uh, Father Dowling Mysteries, Matlock, uh, Jake and the Fat Man, this was all for, for Dean Hargrove, who was the producer. Uh, the Perry Mason movies, wrote several of those. Then I went on and did a show called Under Suspicion, uh, a show called The Huntress, uh, worked on Hercules, uh, the, un the Unexplored Journeys, or whatever they were called. Uh, Law and Order, uh, Law and Order, Criminal Intent. Uh, just a variety. What of was the transition like going from writing comic books to writing some hard boiled drama TV shows? Well, I mean, it wasn't hard boiled drama initially. I mean, initially I was working on Father Dowling. It was sort of like working on a, on a comic book show. Really? Uh, because Father Dowling was a very lighthearted uh, mystery show. You know, we didn't take ourselves too seriously. Uh, we had fun, you know. And, I was in my mid-thirties, I was single, uh, I didn't sleep a lot, I didn't have a life, you know, other than writing, uh, which is pretty much how things have to be for you if you're, when you're breaking into television or, or film, you cannot have a life, because yeah. uh, you have to be available 10, days a, 10 hours a day, 7 days a week, you know, for, for this, uh, and I did that and one, you know, it's, it's a series of one thing leads to another. You meet someone on this show, that person gets hired on another show, they bring you over, you meet those people. It, it just sort of snowballs. And I was lucky enough uh, to make connections uh, that, you know, lasted me for 20 years. You know. Wow. Oh. And then you recently retired. I retired in 2006. I left after doing a law and order CI for about five years, six wow. years. And uh, now I'm back to comic books. You wrote Animal Man. The, the animal did an Animal Man miniseries. Yeah. That was kind of your return, right? 
that was my return. For, yeah, I did that uh, uh, for DC, and then I did a few things for uh, uh, a friend of mine, Jim Salakrub, who was editing for Paper Cuts. He had a, uh, uh, they were doing Hardy Boy comic books, and I, I just loved the Hardy Boys, so yeah. I said, yeah, I don't care what you're paying me, I'll, I'll do those, and I did two or three of those. Uh, and then uh, a couple of years ago, I, I was having dinner with Joe Casada, and we were talking about Marvel, and I was talking about how, even though, you know, it's been 20 plus years since I wrote comics on a regular basis, I've always kind of felt like I was a comic book writer who was doing other things. Yeah. Um, and he said, well, you know, you should do something for Marvel. And, you know, I talked to uh, uh, Axel Alonzo about uh, uh, doing something for Marvel, and he put me in touch with Spider-Man editors, and now I'm doing something with Nick Lowe, which is doing a miniseries that starts next month. Um, Congratulations. Um, that, I, when I saw that you were returning to Spider-Man, I was like, wow, that's going to be... What was it like returning after? It was surreal. I mean, you know, the, it, it's amazing to me how easily I slipped back into the, the, Peter's voice started coming back to me. But here's the thing, is, is that as a writer and as, as a reader, you get different things out of characters at different points in your life. Yeah. When I was writing Spider-Man in my first go-round in the early 70s, I was Peter's age. I was um, 20 years old, you know, dealing with romance issues, dealing with a young adult questions, trying to find an apartment, trying to pay my bills, you know, all that stuff. I related to him totally. He was you. He was me. Um, so a lot of what Peter went through in his life, with the exception of, you know, girlfriends going off to buildings, was stuff that I was going through. Um, then when I came back in my early 30s, uh, to, or, yeah, early 30s to write uh, Web of Spider-Man and Spectacular Spider-Man, um, that was a different stage in my life, you know, and I was actually dealing with more interested in some of the older characters there, like Joe Robertson and, yeah. you know, uh, how their, how life was treating people who were, you know, at that stage of life. So Peter was, for practical reasons, since most of the stories that we're dealing with him personally were going to be taking place in Amazing, I focused more on the supporting cast and that story. Now I'm coming in and I'm, you know, much older and uh, I'm looking at it from a different perspective and I'm finding new values for me as a writer with this character. Uh, and now I'm interested in larger moral questions, you know, as, as the other, hopefully of interest, you know, to the readers. Plus I get to play with characters that I've created and written years and years. That must be so much fun though. Yeah, like, yeah. Well, I was, I mean, when they, when they gave me the opportunity to do something, I immediately pitched a project that would allow me to bring back Tombstone and Hammerhead and other characters that I created from that period. Uh, the premise sounds odd, because I, I, I miss that, that old street, street, street level. level. Yeah. Like, like, I feel like with Spider-Man for the last two years, three or two, three It's been pretty cosmic, yeah. <laughs> Spider-Verse, I'm just like, come on, let's get back to I, I, I loved how that last page in the latest issue Ends where it's like he stops a mugger, yeah, you know, and it's exactly. like, thank you. I just want Peter Parker fighting crime, fighting crime, dipping dirty, down and dirty in New York City, and, and that's that's what your book pretty yeah. after the, it's the Wrath, right? Or just yeah. Wrath, the Wraith, yeah, Wraith. And, we're, 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 and, they, and it's a gang war and it's street level violence, which you did so well back in your run yeah. back then. Yeah, like, right. that was, I love that, that aspect where it's it basically like, punching. Yeah. You know, it's, <laughs> we have, and we, and, and I'm not saying that that should be a sticky diet, you know, but it's it's good to do it, you know, for, for now and then. Yeah. And obviously, people like the Spider-Verse type stuff, yeah, and like the Spider-Man type yeah. stuff, but it's good to, you know, get back to roots occasionally. I think it, you need to go through all that stuff to maybe remember that you like, because, you know, it's just like, okay, I, I, Spider-Man's one of the, like, you know, you always have those characters that you gravitate yeah. towards. Spider-Man's always been one for me. But it's always been like that. I don't like it when he becomes the bigger than life character. Because yeah. he was always the yeah. down to earth character. Well, he's the one who's, who has trouble paying his rent. You know, he's the and, one that could be. And that should be the big crisis of the issue. You know, yeah, that's, <laughs> in my view. I that's think. the great thing. It's like he's anybody in this room. You know, right. Where Tony Stark walks in a room, you're like, oh yeah, of course that's Iron Man. Like, you don't, you know, 
Well, one of the one of the uh, things that makes the character complex now for me, one of the reasons I like Miles Morales as a character, I would love to have written Miles, for example, uh, is that Miles is Spider-Man the way I grew up with Spider-Man. He's yeah. the teenager dealing with the crap of a teenager's life, trying to be a hero at the same time. That was what was cool about Spider-Man for me as a, as a young reader. Uh, Peter Parker today is a guy in his mid-twenties, late-twenties, owning a company, being a major scientist, and you know, it's like, okay, well, that is not as relatable. If, you know, it's not, not a, it's a different class of problems, you know? It's like, we, we actually have time for questions. Questions from the vast audience? I guess we're just still going to continue to talk. Um, how do you feel the way uh, comic books have transitioned from when you started to, you know, it just, it was it was the boys club, it was it was just this really underground and... Yeah, we were, we were the outsiders, uh, well, in a, in a way it's sort of like the progression of rock music, you know. Yeah. Uh, rock music started out with skating rinks, you know. It started out outside the uh, mainstream of American pop culture and fought its way in, and now it is American pop culture. <laughs> now it's yes. cool to like Spider-Man. When I was, when I was in, you know, elementary school, I got picked on for Absolutely. my love for Spider-Man, and now it's like, is that going to cool again? What, what has been? Just taking it from a personal, uh, from my own personal experience, this is the, this is how weird the transition in comics uh, and its importance to pop culture is for me personally. When I started writing films, 1978, I had to hide the fact that I was a comic book writer. Really? I was going to ask you that. It was not part of my CV that people could really get their head around because most of the people who were who were the uh, people who were hiring writers at that point were people who had grown up with comics in the, when they'd grown up in the 50s and uh, early 60s before comics became cool, uh, before they actually had any kind of uh, cultural cachet. And so to them, comics were this, uh, not even outsider art, they were, they were junk, you know. So the fact that you wrote comics was, okay, so what else did you do? So as time went by in my career, there was this kind of weird inversion where sometime in the late 90s, early 2000s, people who were working in the film and television business started wanting to write comic books. And people like Josh Whedon went from, you know, writing film and television to writing X-Men. Yeah. And then people who were writing comic books became important people to write movies and television. Meanwhile, I'm still working on TV and I can't get a job writing on any superhero comic book movie and TV shows because I'm known as a writer of crime procedural things. And I'm like, no, like, <laughs> people, I used to do this. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Let me hand you my omnibus and you get yeah. back to me. <laughs> yeah, it's like, okay. Yeah, I actually went in and, and interviewed for, I interviewed for uh, uh, Lois and Clark and was wow. turned down. I interviewed for Birds of Prey turned down. Uh, I didn't even bother for Smallville. I didn't bother. You know, it's like, what's the point? You know. So, and meanwhile, the guy here's here's a, Mark Guggenheim, who is the uh, showrunner on uh, Arrow. Arrow. He and I both worked on Law and Order. <laughs> and you know, it's like I, I, I contacted him a couple of years ago. I said, you know, hey, Mark, you know, is, is there any any opportunity for me to do an episode of Arrow? I'd love to. You know, not that I want to write TV anymore, but I'm and he said, well, you know, we're trying to get comic book people in, you know, on a, to pitch stories. And I said, Mark, I'm not a comic book person. I wrote television for you for 10 years before you even got into the business. <laughs> so, it's a weird business. I feel, I was, that was going to be my next question was, are you pursuing? No. That, that, that at all? No, I have no real desire to do really? it anymore. It was, it was really fun to do it while I did it, but, you know, I'm, I'm an old patoot this point, you know, and I don't have the energy to do 10 hours a day, 7 days a week, I just don't want to do it. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, I'm very happy with the work I did, and I'm glad to not have to do it anymore. <laughs> you don't miss the writer's room? Yeah, I do, actually. I mean, I, I miss the camaraderie, I miss, I miss putting on a show, 
Yeah. You know, there's something fun about about you know starting from scratch, going through the the, 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 the terror of, of knowing that you've got eight days to get a screen a script together to go on and produce it. Uh, all of that is a lot of fun, but doing that for ten months of the year where you don't have a life, uh, that's a mindset that, that you can really, that really, you start to lose that mindset in your 50s, yeah. and you start going, you know, I really would like to spend my weekend with my family. I'd like to like, have, a, have time to travel. I, you know, no, I just don't want to do that anymore. So are we going to see more comic book work for you? Yeah, comic book work is something I, I would enjoy doing because I can do that and have a life. Any plans past this? Uh, we actually are talking about an ongoing series that I'm going to probably start, and uh, that'll start coming out in the fall. So I can't say what it is yet, but it's uh, it's going to be spider related. Oh, nice. So. And final question: Have you ever thought about doing creator own stuff? Because that's the one thing that yeah, I mean, I've really ventured into, right? It's well, being out of the being out of the comic book business for 20 years, I don't have connections with other creators, other than people who are my own cohort and contemporaries. So uh, I don't have artists that I can call up and say, hey, you want to work with me on a project? Because they're dead. <laughs> it's like, you know, I'd love to work with Gene Cullen on a project. Gene's dead. Yeah. Love to work with John Buscema on a project. Gene's dead. It's, like, it's not going to happen. So, the, you know, I, I need, one of the reasons I like going to cons, you know, is to meet younger artists and maybe make a, make a connection with them. Or so I, I'll, I'll introduce you. Oh, I'll keep you in mind. Oh, keep you in mind. Last question. Out of your entire career, what's the moment that you're most proud of? Uh, uh, if Jerry Conway can leave a mark. Um, well, I, I think what I'm most proud of is also, ironically, the thing that I did least consciously, which was the Gwen Stacy story. Uh, I'm proud of it. In retrospect, because of because it, it provided a uh, a fulcrum that the business sort of turned on for whatever reason, not intentionally on my part, not with any uh, artistic uh, uh, insight, you know, on my part, but it did provide a kind of dividing line between taking taking these things, these stories as uh, disposable emotional literature and then turning it into something where it really wrecked people emotionally and showed us that we could actually do that, you know, in a way that I think people have done much better than I did since. That's great. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're, we're out of time, but Jared, thank you so much for coming by. You'll be hard to right? You, you, you have a table, right? So. All right, make sure you come get some autographs. Thank <laughs> you.